Good evening, party people. Welcome to another Wednesday night Real Mule Revolution. No, it's not Real Mule Revolution. It's Supper Heroes Cook Along. And tonight we are making steak with my triple garlic sauce, some almond green beans, and then my secret weapon, Jemmy Seiji Mash. So a little bit of background. By the way, you know, get yourselves together. If you're still prepping, don't worry, we'll have some time. I'm going to go through all the ingredients now. So this green bean recipe is from the original Real Meal Revolution. And this Jemmy Seiji Mash is actually a, a recipe inspired by uh, Dish Food and Social. So Dish Food and Social is a catering company I work for, you know, in my youth. And we used to do Jemmy uh, Seiji Gooey Potatoes. And, uh, and, and so obviously like trying to come up with like a low carb decadent mash type recipe, um, I use the same, the same technique, which I'm going to show you just now. And instead of adding it to potatoes I'm adding it to, to gem squash. And then with the triple garlic sauce, this, this sauce, I don't know how I came up with it, but, but it's basically, it, it uses all three different flavors of garlic. So we're going to use uh, roasted garlic, which gives you that like rich, um, pungent garlic flavor and then we're going to have caramelized garlic which gives you like a bit of sweet garlic flavor and then at the end we're going to add in some raw garlic which gives you like a, a sharp almost burny peppery type garlic so it, there's a lot of timing and obviously most of you will have roasted your garlic in preparation but so this evening uh we're going to go gem squash first we're going to get that recipe done then we're going to make the garlic sauce and then we're going to make the green beans and then the steak. And, uh, and obviously the steak's the last thing we're going to do. And, and we're going to fry the steak. And then while we're resting the steak, we're going to get everything else warm. And then, and then we'll serve. So it shouldn't take much more than an hour. I'll try to get it done in less than that. Um, but I'm just going to do a quick ingredient check. And then we'll get cracking. So here we go. So I've changed the camera angles. I don't know what you think, but I needed to use my phone for this instead of the facial because um, the picture is so much clearer. And I really want you to see like the texture and the color of things like this roasted garlic. I mean, that is so much clearer than it was on the on the top cam. So, okay, I've got two steaks. Um, I wanted to show you how to caramelize fat, but unfortunately my ribeyes that I bought, well, I had this huge, a whole ribeye. It had, had fat taken off. But I'll show you the method anyway. So these are two ribeyes, a good line of fat in there, which is going to add in lots of extra flavor, delicious. And I think these are, I'd say like 300 grams each. And then for the green beans, we've got your, your green beans here. Um, we've got butter, but I'm actually going to use olive oil because Kate doesn't eat butter. And then slivered almonds. Now, these are slivered almonds. The photograph in the recipe actually has um, sliced almonds. There we go. And you can use either or. It's not important. Um, and then got some lemons, obviously. Where's that in the shot? And then back to the, then I've got like all this cream, more cream than I could ever imagine. Um, roast garlic, white wine, and then some more lemons for that sauce. But the big one, and the one we're going to get started on first, is the Seiji Jemmy Mash. Now, I think I've got, got my sage here. This is the lot of shame. I just killed my whole sage plant in, um, in, in my garden because basically this is all the sage I had left. And, um, and then we've got this, these steamed gem squashes. So these just came out the stove. They are very, they, I, I, th I think I actually overcooked them and I'm glad I did because I wanted to show you a method you can use to to kind of like come back from that so the first thing we're going to do everyone get your gem squashes and then get a bowl and a spoon because we're going to scoop the gem squash into a bowl and then we're going to wring it out okay so first things first in fact in fact you can actually so one of the things i added in the very very last minute was a cloth that you might want to sacrifice so this is a very thick, like heavy duty, um, it's a very sturdy, sturdy dishcloth. Maybe I'll just up the angle here so you can see a bit better. Um, very sturdy dishcloth. And basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to scoop, I'm going to scoop the, the gem squash meat onto the cloth. 
and then we're going to wring it out like a zol. Okay. So I had I had a tablespoon somewhere. Uh, in the meantime, sorry. Before we start that, I think best get a pot on so we can blanch blanch our beans because there's no real need to delay that. And that's just about three fingers of water. You know, nothing too hectic. If you want to see what I'm doing here. Uh, here we go. Boom. And so for those of you wondering, this recipe is from my latest book, Low Carb Cooking, which is this one. And the, let's think, roast garlic sauce is from this. Steak is from wherever. There is a steak lesson in this guy. Jemmy Mash is in here. And then the, the green bean recipe comes from this book, the original Real Meal Revolution. All right, so let's scoop out, scoop out the filling. Okay, now this is actually quite nice and dry. But, so I'm gonna put this straight in the bowl. But if you get a wet one, like this guy, if I show you. There we go. If you see in there, there's like lots of water. It's super wet and it's also like, it's like mushy. This guy needs to be wrung out. So I'm gonna scoop this one onto the dish top. Like a long cigar. This is nice and dry. You can tell it's dry because it's like firm, almost powdery, and it like holds its shape. And that's going in my bowl. And mix it up a little bit so you can see what's going in the bowl and what's not. That's nice and dry. Oh, damn it. <laughs> So the dry stuff's going in the bowl and the wet stuff goes onto the towel. So it, what I'm finding here is that my little ones are a lot wetter than my big ones. So let's plonk that down. And I've got some skin in here. Okay, that's also firm. Okay, so it turns out I haven't overcooked them all as badly as I thought I had. But this demonstration will help anyway. So what I found recently, or well not that recently, when I was researching for the first edition of Real Meal, is that even though gem squash is like one of the most loved ingredients, it turns out it's one of the most, the least nutrient dense ingredients that you get. The least nutrient dense ingredients that you get, which is astonishing. Okay, so here we go. Now you're gonna roll it up, like so. And look, there's a lot of cloth over here, so you may not see all the juice come out, but let's just put it back in this tray. And you just wring it out. There we go. You wring out all that extra water. Sure, that is astonishing. Couldn't find gem squash. Never heard of it. It's very lacquer, Ben. Gem squash is, I, I suppose, like, the closest you'd get to it is really spaghetti squash. But I don't know how well, you know, I haven't ever used spaghetti squash. Um, so I don't know how like wet it gets because you want to be able to puree it. So just for an example, check out how much water was in there. So you want to get all that water out. Okay. And then take this meat, unroll it. And by the way, I do the exact same thing when I... Um, 
when I'm ringing up Cucumber for a uh, for a tzatziki, and Kate gets super um, upset with me because we always have to, we always dye a cloth like bright green. Okay, let's just scrape this out. So obviously, make sure it's a clean cloth, and make sure you have consent, which I didn't actually. Okay, here we go. So that is your your gem squash sorted, big whack of of dry gem squash, and now I'm going to blitz it. Am I going to blitz it? That is the big question. Okay, well, I left my stick blender piece in the house, so we're going to just blitz it like this. Uh, just put in little bits at a time. If you have a stick blender, please proceed with the stick blender. This is definitely not my preferred route. And then just have a bowl on the side to put everything into. Scoop that out into a bowl. There we go. Is that a big enough bowl? Yes, it is. Okay. Now, while I'm doing this, it's worth mentioning that. All of these recipes are available in the Real Meal Revolution online program. So like every single recipe I've ever made is in that program. So if you want to go low carb and you're looking for like meal plans and you want recipes and you want to know how to do all this stuff in context, like in the normal, like in the sort of, I don't like to use the word diet context, but if you want to do a diet, that's what Real Meal Revolution sells. And we've got a team of four coaches who guide you through our program and hold your hand. And then we've also got a map on our website. If you are looking for something special, there's a map on our website at realmealrevolution.com where you can actually go and find a coach in your area. Uh, ben Gardner, who's watching, is one of our coaches. And, they're supposed, and they are trained to guide you through a ketogenic transformation. Okay. Okay, yes, cool. So now I've got all of this puree. Goodness. Now I've got all this puree. So I'm trying to catch up with you now because I assume everyone's just blitzed everything in the stick blender. And there we go, stick blender out. Okay, now you're going to grab your small pot and put it on the big burner. And let me get that angle right because this is critical. You need to be able to see in here. Let me even move some of these things. So I want you to get right in here and see the action. Because what I'm going to do is teach you how to make a bernoisette. So bernoisette, I think noisette is actually a, um, a hazelnut in, in French. But So you're going to fire up this burner. Get it quite hot. And then I think the recipe calls for like three tablespoons of butter. So look at how much butter you have to add for the sagey jemmy mash recipe and add it in. I'm just going all in with what I think is three tablespoons. And what you're going to do is melt it down. And I don't know how hot your pan is. So you're going to melt it down. And then as you melt down butter, it goes nutty. So what I mean by that is the milk protein actually caramelizes and it goes brown. But if you keep the heat high, 
what happens is it goes black. So we want to catch that like magic moment between yellow and black. So if you watch, watch what's happening in my pan. I'm going to show you that, that sweet spot. So the first thing is obviously to make sure all the butter is sort of the same temperature and probably not having it as on as hot a burner. So let's see if we can get a little bit closer. And then while you're doing this, I need you to have your sage on standby and your cream on standby. So get your sage and your cream ready. So what we're gonna do is as this nuts, as this butter goes nutty, we're gonna add our sage. And the moment the sage has gone like crispy and caramelized, we're gonna add the cream because the cream's gonna stop the butter from burning like instantly. Okay, so there you can see, can you see on the edge there, it's starting to go brown. There we go, okay, it's going brown. Let's have a look. Oh, it's brown. Okay, I'm gonna take it off the heat. Swirling my, um, swirling my sage. So the sage is now cooking and you can see it's brown because that, um, yeah, the foam has gone like this red, which is what you want. And what that's, and basically the sage already drops the temperature, okay? So the sage is gonna stop it burning a little bit. And I'm just going to pop it down for a little bit more of a burn. And then I'm going to grab my cream. And I'm now on standby, watching to make sure it doesn't burn. And then I'm going to throw my cream in. And if any of my old dish crew are watching this, like and share, leave a comment. Tell me if you remember sagey gooey potatoes. Cool. So what you can see there is... Uh, there we go. As you can see that the butter's actually gone this nutty, beautiful brown color. So before we burn it, and it stopped foaming that much, now I'm just gonna add the cream. So what you're gonna get is when the cream infuses with this nutty butter, you're basically gonna get like um, hazelnutty, sage, creamy goodness and we're going to reduce that down into like a thick goo so it's almost like burnt and then we're going to mix it with the sage and then obviously the sage is going to taste like creamy sagey goodness and that's why it's called uh creamy jemmy sagey mash okay so while this cream is getting to the boil and we're going to keep an eye on it because we don't want it to to um to boil over but we're just going to watch it if your water's boiling this is a good time for you to throw your blanche, your, your green beans in. So I'm gonna do that. And then while they're blanching, I'm just gonna get a, a bowl of cold water together and keep an eye. Keep an eye on your um, keep an eye on your cream. I'm doing it on like the most ridiculously hot stove top. There we go. So now you can see this. This is what you should be doing, watching the cream, watching the beans. Okay. Okay, if you're wondering what I'm doing now, I'm trying to get them all together so that I can cut the, the buds off. It's actually easier to do it in the packet. Okay, my cream's having a bit of a party here. So I'm gonna see if it wants to boil over. And then I might just drop it down. So here, I've made the flame a lot smaller and I'm just sort of like letting it tick away. Okay. Then take all your green beans, take the sort of bums off. I've got them all once one soldier got away. Okay, there we go. And Kate and I don't like the other end, but some believe that is waste. And if it, you think that's waste, don't let me stop you because it totally is. Whack of salt, I don't feel like grinding. So I'm just going to take a little bit of out the jar. Salt in your water. Beans in there. Swirl your cream. And if you've got a spare hand, 
fill it with some cold water. And if you want to go the extra mile with this cold water, you can grab, grab some ice. And I'll explain the theory behind that in a second. So the idea of the cold water is to We want really, really green, green beans. And so what you can see in the pan over here is that they've gone super green. Let's bring that over here. Oh, that wasn't supposed to happen. Um, so they've gone super green and we want them to keep that green. And we also want them to while wow, this thing's playing up. We also want them to stay crunchy. And what happens often is when you cook your beans and you let them uh, cool themselves naturally, so you just leave them off the stove, then the, the heat that they've got from being cooked actually lets them carry over cooking. So we call it, uh, especially with fish, when you're grilling a piece of fish and you think it's perfect and then you leave it on the side, the heat from the fish actually cooks the fish. So even though it was perfect when it came out the pan, what can happen is it starts cooking itself even more with its own temperature. So by having an ice bath over here, the ice bath basically shocks the vegetable so that it stops cooking. And the colder the ice bath, obviously the more effectively it shocks it. And um, the smaller it is, the less effective. Because if you take a huge bunch of beans and you chuck it into some like cold water that doesn't have any ice in it, then it's just going to warm the water and they're going to sit like lukewarm. So you want the water as much as possible and as cold as possible um, without, you know, violating water restrictions and all of that sort of stuff. So this cream is coming along nicely. Let's give it a swirl if you want to see how thick it is. We've still got a long way to go with this. And our beans are almost done. Beans. Okay. I think they might actually be done. Have a look here. I'm happy with that. So what I'm going to do, ah, I, brought, I did bring tongs, yay, is, okay, and that cream's looking good too. There we go. So I'm just going to take these beans out and drop them straight into the cold water. And, and what you can do is after they've cooled down and stopped cooking, generally, like, if you wanted to do this a day before, they actually keep for, like, two to three days in the fridge like this. And what we do in the restaurants is you put them in a, in a container, like a plastic container, and you just put a layer of, of paper towel at the bottom of the container, um, and then you leave the beans on there. And then any juice that they do actually release just goes into the paper towel. So instead of, like, chucking the veg out, um, you just – you don't have to because they stay fresh on the paper towel and it's the same with herbs. So if you were prepping masses of green beans for a party like the next day or even on a, you know, on a Thursday for a Saturday, this is the best thing to do because it makes sure they stay crunchy um, and then all you do is like dry them and then reheat them on the day. I'm going to take, um, take my water away. And by the way, if you've only got two pots, you can totally turf this water because I'm going to use this pot to make the sauce, the garlic sauce, triple garlic sauce. Okay. Let's see how this is doing. So if you look here, you can see it's like, it's like super gooey. Can you see that bubbling, bubbling goodness? Trying to get the, the right angle. There we go. That's almost there. Let's just give it a little go. Tighten this thing. There we go. I just want you to get an idea of the viscosity. So it's, you see it's super thick and gooey now, and actually when you tip it, 
you can see it like bubbling on the side of the pan. There we go. That's ready. That's what we want. Okay, I think, I think that's what we want. Cool. So now that you've got this sticky, gooey, sagey goodness sauce, you're gonna take your little bit of um, uh, sage mash. And by the way, this exact same thing will work perfectly for butternut or pumpkin. Sage, butter, cream, pumpkin, super cool. Butternut and sage is like what we call in, in culinary terms, a marriage of flavor. So take note. All right, and now we just mix that all in together. If you wanted to with your stick blender, you could give this another whiz, but you really don't have to. So just look at that. Look at that goodness. And, uh, and so I'm just gonna let this keep ticking away on a smaller burner so that basically the moisture keeps evaporating from um, the gem squash and it keeps getting like thicker and richer because we want this to almost be like a spoon of mash on the plate. It's like, it's gonna be epic again. So I light this little burner at the back and just let it tick away. Is that the one? No, this one. There we go. And if yours is thick enough and you're happy with the consistency and it looks kind of like that, that's cool. I'm gonna try and get mine even thicker. And then we'll season it, we'll season everything right at the end. I remember the first time we shot a video of this, the camera crew were going nuts. So that is that. Exactly what I intended. Okay. Yeah, now we're gonna make the mushroom sauce. And there's a bit of prep to do for the mushroom sauce. Let me just turn this off. Turn that off. And let's get this down. There we go. Okay, so you've got, I think the recipe calls for two, for a head and a half of garlic. These are tiny little heads. I mean, I don't have very big hands. These heads are very small. So I'm just gonna go ahead and use like two whole heads. Um, but I think the recipe called for two heads of garlic and there was one and a half roasted and then one half raw. So these we can actually save till the very end, but take your, your half clove. I'm obviously gonna use like a full clove. And, uh, and what we're gonna do is peel it and, and then we're gonna start making the sauce. So the first thing, kind of take, the, the raw is actually what you need the least of. So if you break the head, and you can't divide it exactly, take like, take the, 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 the biggest half and we're gonna use that to make the caramelized and that's how we're gonna start the sauce. So we're gonna start the sauce by caramelizing the garlic off. So you just cut the tail off. Let's see if I can get a better angle here. There we go. So just cut the tails off. Like so. And, and then just make it quick, just crunch them. And then just get that skin off. And we're just gonna give it actually a, like a rough chop, not even gonna chop it too fine because it actually caramelizes better when you've got bigger chunks, I find. And for those of you who are miles ahead, got an exciting podcast coming up. But I also had an exciting podcast this week. I chatted to Andrew Oddington, who is the founder of the Regen Ag, which is the basically the Regenerative Agriculture Society of South Africa. And we had a long chat about, about sort of sustainability and, and their ways to farm. I mean, regenerative agriculture is actually amazing. I'm also just gonna peel the rest of the head, even though I'm not gonna use it right away. And I'll show you what we're gonna use that for later. So just, and I apologize if you got one of those Woolworths heads with these microscopic cloves. Those are my absolute worst. So there's the, that's for chopping and caramelizing. And uh, we were chatting about how you can farm in a way that actually restores the environment and puts carbon, takes carbon out of the environment, which is fascinating. 
And, um, and I'm very proud to say that our podcast is now on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, or I don't, I'm not an Apple guy, I'm an Android guy, but on Apple Podcasts. So if you want to go check that out, there's, there's one with an immunologist about the immune system and COVID-19, and he reckons COVID-19 was created by men, which is um, not men, by people. And, uh, and then there's one I interviewed, Robert Sivas, about how sugar um, works and the role it might play in, in making COVID-19 slightly more aggressive in your system. And I had one last week with a guy called Kun van Sayen, who is an investor in regenerative agriculture. So we were talking about like the financial side behind um, behind regenerative agriculture. And then yesterday, I chatted to Andrew. And Andrew was talking about, you know, the landscape in South Africa and how, you know, there's this band of brothers essentially getting getting regenerative agriculture going. And Basically, we can we can use it to regenerate soil, and he reckons soil is South Africa's most valuable asset, and all we do is export it, and we're never replenishing it, and it's a fantastic way to reverse climate change. So check it out, and that's the Superheroes podcast, or if you just hit my page, the Jono Proudfoot, you can go and scroll through all the videos there, and you'll see it. It's another live like this. Okay, so as you can see, I'm not really giving this a proper chop. I'm just kind of like chopping it loosely. I would say this is loosely chopped, not finely chopped. And I'm going to leave it there. And then I'll uh, probably leave that for later. Okay. There we go. And this. Okay, so grab your pot, whichever pot you've got, medium pot if you've got one left, and also give your, if you're still reducing your gem squash, give it a stir. Mine's starting to catch a bit at the bottom, but that's fine. I don't mind a little bit of extra color. I'll just bring it into frame. So that is like, is about as thick as it can get. I think you could probably dehydrate it more but you probably have to wring it out a little bit more seriously. So that's just going to leave that like that and take it off the heat. And now enter the triple garlic sauce. And obviously I explained earlier, the reason it's triple garlic is because it's got three flavors of garlic and I'm going to use butter. Maybe that's a bit hot. Put it on like a medium heat. We don't want it to burn. And then butter. And I, th I don't remember how many tablespoons. I think it was like two tablespoons of butter. That looks like two. <laughs> it's like two, two fingers of butter. There we go. Put that back. And we're going to get our butter ready. Now, we don't want the butter to, to burn in this case. We just, we just want it to be nice and melted. So let me get the camera right. There we go. Maybe I'll pump it up a little bit. And while you're waiting for your butter to melt, if you want, I've just realized I didn't put all my green beans in. What a silly guy. You can take your green beans and drain them. I'm just going to take them uh, out of the water and put some paper towel on the bottom. Drain off any last bits of, of liquid. Uh, if you've got any questions or you want to catch up, please let us know. I can see that lots of comments, which I haven't seen. Let me click on the comments. Lots of comments. Goodness me. Okay. Cool. All right. So if you are looking closely, you can see it's gone. It's about to go a little bit nutty in some areas. So before it goes nutty, I'm going to throw in my garlic. And I'm going to turn down my temperature because I had it on quite hot. But just give that garlic a swirl. It's going to take the temperature right down. And then bring it down to... And the idea here, what you want to do is you want to get the garlic to be like almost 
almost like burnt on the edges. So the reason you've got these big pieces is so it doesn't burn and evaporate because you're gonna have some raw garlic in the middle still. Um, so if I can get it nice and close, you can see it's in reverse because it's like selfie mode. But basically we are frying it around like that. And I'll show you, like we want, we want just the edges to have like a tiny bit of black on them. Maybe not even black, maybe like slightly dark brown. Uh, and then we're gonna add in, I think it's, yeah, we've got white wine and lemon zest, lemon juice, and the meat of the garlic. So now's the best time to, to, to get the meat of the garlic out. And don't worry, like the, once we chuck the wine in, it's gonna stop caramelizing the garlic. Okay, so to get the meat out of the garlic, there are two ways. The one is you can use a teaspoon. In fact, that might actually be the best method, but sometimes the cloves are too small. But you can go in like this, and you can get a whole, let's, let me show you that again. There we go. So you go with a teaspoon in, or like this, and you just scoop it out. And this is gonna give you the best yield you know, because you're actually targeting each clove. The other way is to cut the thing in half and squeeze it. But you actually leave quite a lot in the head. So I'm going to go in and harvest each clove. That one I might have to squeeze out, and I'll show you how to do that as well. There we go. Get this guy. Come on. There we go. And okay, now these, where the, maybe the lid wasn't cut off enough, you can just squeeze them at the base. And then they kind of come out in little bits. And that's fine. So let's see what else I got here. Squeeze this puppy. And it all just comes out. Here we go. Okay, now you'll see my garlic is starting to caramelize. That's good, because the butter's burning. That's, that's the flavor we want. There we go. Can everyone see that's going golden brown? Now that is going to be bitter and sweet. And this is when we add in the wine. And sorry, I was just checking that my sound's working. Okay, so that's now stopped the, the cooking process to a degree. And what you can do if you want to take a break from your garlic is just grate some zest in here. Um, you could use this on a grater, and you also don't need the zest. It's not like an essential ingredient, but it does give it a nice zing. And, oh, and then some juice. So just cut it in half, squeeze a little bit of juice. I think it's like a couple tablespoons. You don't need too much. It's just to freshen it up a little bit. Um, you don't really want to add juice at the end after you've added the cream. Okay, so I will proceed with the garlic. And to be honest, there isn't really a limit to the amount of garlic you can put in. I just think that, um, you know, it gets expensive uh, after a while. But if you wanted to go crazy, you could put in like much more than what I'm putting in. Because look, let's be honest, like it's not like it's going to make your garlic breath any worse if you add in another clove. There we go. So what this sauce really teaches us is that is how the method has such an impact on the way you prepare an ingredient. And some people might say, oh, well, I don't like garlic, but actually they don't like raw garlic. And in fact, they don't mind roasted garlic because roasted garlic has got a totally different flavor to, to raw garlic. And caramelized garlic has got a totally different flavor to both. So um, this is the same in all ingredients. If you cook them differently, they taste different. But in this sauce, you know, combining all three, it's like you don't even know where the garlic's coming from. It's coming at you from all angles. Here's my wet cloth. 
Okay, so that's reducing. We've got our garlic head. I think I might just steal a few more of these because we're not going to use them for anything else. While I'm here, and then if you if you've got a stick blender, then please feel free to not do what I'm about to do. But I don't have a stick blender out here because I left it inside. So I am going to do something else, and and you can follow me if you don't have one. Okay, so squeezing the last little bits out. That's some good yield, actually. Okay. This is the key. Sauce making is like my, my favorite thing on earth. And these different methods really do make a difference in a sauce. If you just put in like raw garlic and thought it would happen, you'd be in for a totally different experience. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna mash this into paste. So you're gonna take your knife, lie it down flat, and then curl it up. And basically the technique is to mash it like this. So lie it down flat, curl it up. And then eventually what you can do is actually lift it like this, then turn it, and then move it and mash it. So it's going to take some practice, but basically you're going to just mash, mash this into a paste. And if there are bits and pieces that are, that are whole, that's fine. You just cut through them at the end. But basically we're using the knife to mash, 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 mash. Oh, mash, mash. And so obviously if you had a stick blender, you would just throw everything into the sauce and mash it. But like I said, I, I don't have one. So run the knife through, mash, and I'll use the knife to lift everything in and drop it into the sauce. And that is gonna be that is the business right there. That is a lot of really delicious garlic. And if you're a bread eating person, I recommend taking one of those cloves and just squeezing it out straight onto a piece of good sourdough and eating it just like that because there are very few experiences that are as delicious as that. Yum. Okay. So let's give that a stir. Now we've got the raw garlic, the the caramelized garlic. We've got the sorry, we've got the caramelized garlic, and we've got the roast garlic in the sauce. And it's getting quite thick now, so you can see it's reduced by quite a lot. Um, it's kind of like infusing all of these little flavors together, and damn, it's looking good. Okay. I reckon this is actually nicer because you're still going to get those chunks instead of stick blending the whole number. Right. And then the final step, well, the final step for now is to add the cream. So take your one cup of cream and just look at this. So that what the garlic's done is actually thickened the sauce quite a lot. So you can see it's actually quite viscous. It's got like, it's quite thick. So we're going to take our cream, chuck it in there, and pretty much the same as the previous one, we're just going to use the cream to reduce until it's like kind of less thick and gooey than it was for the sage, but also thick and gooey. And that's, it's going to be amazing. Okay. So I'm going to crank that up, let it boil away. And then while your sauce is kind of boiling away and getting delicious you can test the seasoning on everything but then we're going to get into the steak lesson and we're going to get the beans ready so basically the beans are the last step because once the beans and the sauce and the puree are done you're kind of ready to serve so then we just need to get the steak done and it's ready and we're ready to eat so lastly just to have all of our prep ready we're going to take these raw cloves of garlic and we are going to microplane them now again 
If you don't have a microplane, you can grate them on the fine grater, or you can just finely chop them. But what we're going to do is, as we serve the sauce, almost literally like we're going to stir it in just before we plate up, we're going to add this fresh raw garlic, and that's going to give it this burst of like um, peppery goodness. In fact, I learned this trick in 2003 on my gap here in a tiny pub um, in Bournemouth, uh, the Belvedere Hotel. And this chef who, I don't know if he was a great chef or not. I mean, I can hardly remember working for him, but he taught me how to make a Napolitano sauce, a garlic, uh, like tomato, Italian pasta base sauce. And he taught me that the best way to get the garlic like really coming through in the sauce is to chop it all in advance. And then as you take it off the stove to just chuck it in. So I'm going to microplan it. And Louise remembers eating gem squash roasted with butter and a bit of salt. It's so delicious and sad to hear there are no, they are not nutrient dense. It's very, <laughs> it is sad. And everyone thinks, oh, we're eating our vegetables, you know, meat and two veg and whatever. But actually gem squash is better described as a vessel for transporting butter into the mouth. Okay. And I do stand to be corrected on the nutrient dense thing with, with gem squash. It's, it's hearsay, but I'm, I'm not surprised. It's kind of like watery. Okay, there we go. That's raw grated garlic. And even these tiny little pieces, I'm just going to chop, pop them all in. So now you have this on the quick draw for when you're going to serve, but you can leave it all aside. Check the sauce, give it a little stir, make sure it's not catching. But it's fine if it's boiling away, you just want it to reduce. We want it to reduce as fast as possible. That's looking great. Cool, so while that's going, I'm actually gonna move that onto another burner. I'm gonna put it on the back because I wanna show you how we're gonna do the beans. Uh, and the beans I'm doing in olive oil, even though it says butter, because Kate's gonna have some beans. Pop this on the back and move this so you can see both. Okay, there we go. I'll just keep burning all the hair off my arms. So get a medium sized pan, get it on the heat. And we're gonna do the beans quickly and then obviously we'll set the beans aside. And the way it's going, everything's, look, everything's gonna come together at the same time. So if you want, you can put your gem squash onto a tiny flame so that it stays warm. Gem squash would be this one. And I'm gonna put it on a tiny little flame. There we go. Now, what I want to do here is I just want to toast, toast my, my nuts. So a little bit of olive oil. Some may say that's quite a lot. Get your nuts ready and then get some lemon juice. You don't need a lot. I'm going to go with like half a lemon. And we're just going to throw the nuts into the, into the oil. And what we're looking for is, is some color and some action. We want the nut flavor to infuse into the oil so that the, the oil tastes nutty, but also so that the nuts get caramelized a little bit. And what you'll see is they start to bubble. So I can see my nuts are starting to bubble, which is good. Maybe just a touch more olive oil. And the idea is that these nuts bubble and, and hiss. And then as we toss the beans in them, they start to, they actually coat the beans and you get like beans mixed with nuts and a bit of lemon juice. And it's very classic. I think in, um, I can't remember the French name, but I know it's almondine, which means French for like with almonds. Uh, and, and green beans and almonds is like a very, very classical French accompaniment. Green beans, I think when I wrote the first or the last one, cookbook, my intention was to have green bean and almonds 
with uh, tarragon roasted chicken as like the ultimate French lunch. Okay, yes. Okay, so here we are. This is starting to catch. We turn the temperature down quite a lot. Like off. And let me give you an idea of the consistency here. So you can see it's bubbling a bit like caramel. Whoa. We can probably reduce this a little bit more, which I will. Okay, while, while that was happening, my nuts got toasted quite fast. And I don't want them to get much more toasted than this. So I'm going to throw in my cheese, okay? Throw in my lemon juice and my beans. Okay, and that, with the heat off, turn the heat off because the pan's going to carry on cooking everything. That is green beans with almonds. And give that a good crack of salt and pepper. Pretty generous. While you're seasoning now, I think season the sauce. Good whack of salt. Salt in the sauce. Salt in your gem squash. And then pepper in whatever you want pepper in. I'm gonna leave the pepper out of the garlic. And I'm going to leave it out of there, but I'm going to put pepper into my beans. And then we're going to do the steak. Okay. So here we are. Seasoned and done. Yum. And we'll put that aside. Because now it's time for the steak. So if you want to, if you if you're done with your beans and you're not gonna and you want to reheat them in the microwave or whatever, that's fine. You can tip them out of the pan, and then just give the pan a quick wipe and get it ready for the steak. Otherwise, if you want to just, you know, if you've got a spare pan lying around, that's fine. Let's get that pan ready. So now we're gonna cook the steak, and there there are a few rules with steak. So my steak, if you look at it, you can see it's like dry. There's no like blood on it. Or, or anything like that. It's 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 really dry uh, and it's clear. Unfortunately, I don't have this layer of fat on my steak. So if you do have a layer of fat, I'll show you what to do with it now. But basically, you want your steak dry and you want a hot pan. Those are the most important rules with steak. Let me just check the sauce here. I feel like it could be a tiny bit, just a tiny bit thicker. See here? They say sauce consistency coats the back of a spoon. So by restaurant standards, that is actually perfect. Okay. In my gem squash is stir. Now, seasoning, lots and lots of salt and pepper. And season your fat. So if you do have this, if you do have this uh, fat ridge on top, that's great. Season that first, and you're going to give it a ton of salt. So don't be shy, really, because it's a lot of it gets a lot of it falls off during cooking. So tons of salt on the fat. This is hypothetical fat in my case, obviously. And then you're going to tip it. Season all over. And I don't put pepper on the fat. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. It's no biggie. But I put salt and pepper on, on the sides every time. Let's 
flip it. Salt. And by the way, a note on salt. Please do not go out and buy Himalayan crystal salt or salt from like the Andes or whatever. It's just totally wasted. South Africa has got great salt. England has great salt. Wherever you are in the world, the chances are salt occurs naturally in your area. And you should just use that because the impact that different salt's going to make on your life and your health is minuscule. Like if you, I think if you just ate whatever salt you wanted and like gave up two chocolates a year, that would be the difference that different types of salt make. I think, unless you're talking about iodine. Okay, now lots of seasoning and we're ready to rock and roll. So we fire up this pan and you know, there's a, there's a trade-off because for health, Everyone knows that as soon as oil reaches its smoking point, it, uh, it denatures and that becomes unhealthy, I think. Um, but on the, on the flip side, every time you cook steak in cold oil, it like releases juices and becomes average. So in my case and, you know, in my kitchen, I would rather burn oil and make delicious steak than have bad steak and healthy oil. That's just like a trade-off I've decided on for the rest of my life. So I use olive oil. Uh, I don't like coconut oil, especially if I'm doing it with like French flavors because the coconut is like an Asian or tropical flavor and French is very like classical flavor. If you want coconut oil, that's fine. It does have a higher smoking point. And if you want butter, that's also fine. By the way, butter is the more delicious thing to cook steak in, but Kate's trying to, or Kate doesn't eat dairy. So I'm doing the dairy free option, which is olive oil. And that's just how we go. Uh, what I meant to say, by the way, is if you are, if you do have a big fat line on your steak, you can put your steak fat side down in the pan like this while the pan is still cold. And then you just leave it there and you can hold it there with tongs. And, um, and what will happen is, you leave it there for like 10 or 10 minutes even to just cook and what it does is it renders the fat and makes it crispy so even when you tip the steak on its side and you go tss, tss, you're going to have like a rare even blue steak but the fat's going to be super crispy and if you cook the fat for ages it still doesn't really cook any part of the steak so that's just a little lesson here unfortunately i don't have a lot of fat on these guys so i'm actually going to take them out until the the oil's a little bit hotter. I don't think I was particularly wise there. Okay. And we don't need the lemon juice anymore. We don't need this cutting board anymore. So while you're waiting for your pan to get hot, it's, it's almost time for dinner. So make sure whoever's setting the table is setting the table. Make sure you are at peace with your kitchen being in a mess while you enjoy a good meal and um, get your plates ready. Oh no, we are gonna use the cutting board again. I apologize. Because we're gonna cut the steak after it's rested. In fact, we're gonna rest the steak on this thing. Okay, now you notice this thing's been on the heat the whole time and it's still not ready. So we want it to get like stinking, stinking hot. And what I'm waiting for is for the oil to smoke. I can see it smoking now. That smoke's coming from um, the gem squash, not the pan. I want to see if this... Okay, if you look very carefully at, the, at this pan, you can actually see smoke coming out. And that's what we want. Smoke coming out of the pan. Let me turn this off. There we go. You should be able to see a little bit of smoke coming off. Maybe if I lift it. There we go. That's smoky. So when I say get a pan smoking hot in any of my recipes, this is what I mean. Smoking hot. I'm going to turn the fan on. 
and open the door. So someone just comment if you can't hear me. Okay, and Noreen says, We love this recipe. Thanks, Noreen. I appreciate it. And I don't think I, oh, let me turn the fan on. Here we go. So there's actually, while the steak's cooking, you basically you don't want to, you only really want to turn it once on each side. But there's, in the back, there's a basics section, I think. Is it the back? No, it's the front. Where I actually give like a whole lesson on how to cook steak. And I show you like how to get it medium rare. So that's about right for me. See all that color? And all that color comes from being um, in a being dry, going into a hot, heavy base pan, being well seasoned, and, and also being in being cooked in fat. So if you cook it when it's wet, it's just gonna like release all its juices and kind of like boil. And I hope you can hear the sizzle. I'm trying to get my mic in there. Okay, by the way. It's perfectly okay to eat raw beef, um, so you could just put the, place, the steak back in here to rest, but I'm going to, I don't know, for health and safety, I'm going to rinse the plate. <laughs> there we go. So there isn't really a set time on each side to get the rarity right. It's kind of something you got to practice. You know, you can go by this whole like um, different finger, like different, what, where are we here? Like different finger. They say like that's blue, that's rare, that's medium, and that's well done. But, you know, every single piece of steak is different, so it doesn't really make any sense. Ideally, what you got to do is just cook lots of steak. So this, I can tell that's like rare. Maybe even a little bit past rare. And this, that's rare now. And I like mine slightly medium rare. Kate actually likes his blue. So I've overcooked it for her. Um, and so just so you know, I just put it down onto a cold place so it can rest. And leave it a little bit longer. And you can see, if you look carefully, you can see on the steak, there's like bits of juice coming off the top. That's juice. That's usually an indication that you're like, you're on medium rare. So I'm going to put this outside so it doesn't smoke out the studio. And now, you just want to get everything together. So for me, it's like getting the plates together. Um, so while the meat rests, this is the critical time. The reason we rest is because basically everything's like tense because it's been under heat. And by resting it, you let everything like kind of relax again. It's very hard to explain this without like speaking about science. But basically, the rest, if you slice it before you've rested it, often you get this like spill of blood onto the cutting board. Um, but if you just leave it for a few minutes, you know, I've cooked the steak for five minutes. So if I leave it for just two minutes, two or three minutes, it's going to just relax. And then when I slice it, all that juice is going to stay in the meat or most of it, not all of it. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, if you take like a big joint, like a big sirloin and you cook it for 20 minutes, you want to rest it for like five, maybe eight minutes, maybe even 10 minutes, let it kind of really relax. Cause when you slice it, 
again, you want to keep all those juices in. So while that's resting, yum, I'm going to put my sauce back on the heat, get my beans. And now it's game time. So we light up all the burners. Okay, these, this gem squash is still silly hot, so I'm quite comfortable. It doesn't need to be reheated. And where's my flamethrower? Come on, dude. Oh, here you go. Oh, this guy doesn't work, I don't think. No, it doesn't work. So we'll put the beans there. And also just leaving it on a very gentle heat. Like mine, my bean, my nuts almost went the wrong way. So I'm just going to kind of keep them warm. And then the sauce is the one that really needs the work. So the sauce, you want to get fired up nicely. Because that's kind of like thickened a little bit. Oh, look at that. Taste it. Damn it, it's just always so good. So I want to bring this to like a gentle simmer again. And then I'm going to turn the heat way down. Okay, so while you're getting your sauce warmed again, my steak's definitely ready to be sliced. So you could just serve it now as it is, give, put it on a plate. But I want to show you like, I guess, not how I would plate it in a restaurant, but what I'm, you know, how I intend the dish to be. Maybe I will plate it like a restaurant. Okay, so here's my little piece of steak. Mm. That's what you want. That's the goodness right there. A nice line of fat down the middle. Okay. So first things first, listen, I haven't plated in a restaurant in forever, so please forgive me. But if I remember what I saw last time there was a restaurant open, it's like, do the spread. See my sauce? Bubbling, bubbling, bubbling. Now I'm going to turn it off. So turn off your sauce, turn off your beans. And the last move for this sauce is to take this raw garlic and drop it in. And give it a proper stir. Because the raw garlic, that's going to give it that peppery deliciousness. And there we go. Obviously, this is like a pathetic portion because it's bloody tiny. So take it with a pinch of salt. And then I'm going to scoop up some of these delicious almonds. Maybe put those around there. Ban your steak. I don't know if they're still fan steak, to be honest. I don't know if people still do this. Um, and then finally, give that steak some of your delicious sauce. Triple garlic sauce and steak. I mean, where does that come from? 
So now you've created like the most amazing fine dining steak dish with toasted almonds, green beans, roasted garlic sauce, sagey, creamy, jemmy mash. So I hope you like that. Uh, I'm going to go and eat this. And next week, we'll be back with more. If you enjoyed that and you enjoy your supper, please post us a picture and, uh, and stick it on the feed. I want to hear your comments. Um, please like this post and share it. Invite your friends to join next week. We want to get as many people cooking along as possible. And if there's any topic that you'd like me to discuss while I'm cooking off, if it's something to do with mindset and adjusting to a low-carb diet, if it's anything to do with like uh, food ethics and the food supply chain, I'd love to talk about that. And, and if you have anything else you think I should research or look into for another cook along, please post a comment. Also, comment on who you'd like me to have as a guest in a cook along or who you'd like me to have as a guest um, in a podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for spending your Wednesday, Wednesday evening with me. And we'll see you again next week, Wednesday. That's me. I'm out. Check you later.